make no provision. Make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Make no plan, set no policy, make no provision. In a time when increasingly people are once again building bunkers, building bomb shelters, secret rooms are being constructed filled with food, supplies to outlast the fall of civilization, things that we did during the earlier stages of the Cold War when we feared atomic attack, now we fear biological attack, atomic attack, general social upheaval, riots like those in 2020, an increasing number of people, some I know personally, have their houses equipped with all sorts of firearms in hidden places, food in secret and hidden pantries, you name it. Make no provision. Now in the broader sense, this is about everything we do in life. We make provision or we are provisioning when we buy groceries, when we pay our bills to keep food, clothing, and shelter over our head to keep those things flowing that we need to live. You don't live in this world without some sort of a plan, at least not in any real sense we could call living. Any sort of productive lifestyle requires a plan and goals, enough earning to pay enough bills, and etc. But Paul warns us about making provision for the flesh making provision to gratify our lusts and our desires. It can't be emphasized enough how easily and how often we do this. It's one thing to come to confession and say that you have sinned. You gave in a temporary moment of lust. You did something that our flesh and our soul in its rebellion are wont to do ever since the fall. Those things happen. But if you already bought tickets to Vegas with every intention of visiting a house of prostitution in a place where it's legal, you are making provision for a trip. You can't come back after and say, Pastor, I'm really, really sorry. Maybe you will, and maybe you will be. Hopefully, you are moved to repentance. But planning to sin, figuring it into your budget, figuring it into your lifestyle, figuring out when and where you're going to do it, it's really surprising how often we do this, or rather how often, how easily it is done in our current culture. We're only an internet click away from pornography, the addiction to which has become a modern epidemic. Young people selling pornographic videos and images of themselves on websites like OnlyFans it has become an easy thing to have a subscription to something that is wicked, to sell something that is wicked, to be involved in it because you really needed the money and yet what it sucks out of your soul, what it sucks out of your dignity is absolutely priceless and irreplaceable. And how hard it is to always know the place, the, the, the place where you've crossed the line, like the atrocities that are produced in modern entertainment. Is it, is it okay to pay for Disney Plus because you wanna watch, watch the Apple Dumpling game? Given the other things that they promote and that they put on, at what point are we making provision? Are we paying for, and unfortunately, because we live in a society that uses our tax dollars for wickedness, we can't escape being caught up in it to some degree. Somewhere, somehow or another, we are paying for the murder of infants in the womb. We are paying for bombs to fall on people we don't know and ought to have no grudge against, never met, never will, not in this world. Our funds and our provisions get taken from us and used. Of course, we are not guilty in the instance of having to pay taxes, having to obey that law, not knowing how they will be used, and yet the truth is we're also not clean. We vote for one or another, usually for the least offensive candidate. We are at some level involved in it or beneficiaries of a system that continues to do wickedness. None of us get out of this world clean. We are sinners in a sinful world. But we do so often overtly in the things that we buy, the things we are invested in, the things that we consume, 
the things that we plan to do, the things that we've done and say we're sorry, but we know we're going to do them next week. Our wickedness is such that we want to make provision for that. The idea of being in circumstances where we couldn't do it becomes unacceptable to us because it's so hard for us. Well, left to our own devices, it is impossible for us to let go of our attachment to sinful and worldly things. Best of all, the misery and struggle against the wickedness of the world and being attached to it, the misery and wretchedness of a world that will come to an end at the second coming of Christ, and yet this is Advent. Pastor James mentioned on Sunday quite clearly, yes, every Advent begins the same way as Holy Week, the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. It's really not what we would expect, even when we've done it for every church year our entire life. If we were sitting down to chart out our own church year, we would have all of the readings of Advent feel like they more had to do with Christmas. We mistakenly address this as the Christmas season in our culture, though the season of Christmas doesn't begin until Christmas Eve on the church calendar. Christmas stretches just from Christmas Eve to the Epiphany, January 6th, and then we enter the season of Epiphany. It's a very short season of 12 days, not surprisingly, the 12 days of Christmas, as the old hymn tells us, or the old Christmas carol tells us. So what we get in Advent are not an abundance of prophecies about the Christ child yet to come. We don't get all these scripture readings about the beauty of the nativity. What we get through Advent is the whole story, again, of the child who is God and man who comes into the world to save us from our sins, the heavenly provision, the thing that we could not do, save ourselves, the thing we cannot do, strengthen ourselves, the thing we cannot do, overcome our own sin and temptation in the world. God has already made provision. He told Adam and Eve immediately after the fall, a descendant of the woman would crush the serpent's head. And so before we get to the child in the manger, before we begin the official church year Christmas season, we first revisit in Advent all the things that are intended by God to be revealed in the Advent of our Lord Jesus Christ of his coming and being manifest into the world beyond even his incarnation in the womb and his birth in the stable. We get the telling of the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the one who is the true king of Israel come to his kingdom. In about a week, we will get the readings of the second coming of Christ and the judgment day, all the reminders again in the overlap of the end of the church year and the beginning of a new one of what Christ comes into the world to do. The beautiful baby who is laid, is laid in a manger, who is nothing less than food for you and me. For we wicked beasts who cannot save ourselves, he comes, the Christ child, to be true bread, true wine, true body and blood to feed us. The Christ child born in blood from the delivery of his mother's womb, that first blood shed for the atonement of the world, everything pointing to the way, the way to his being our heavenly food that he will be swaddled and laid in a manger, even as we have him covered by pyramids here before and after the Eucharist is distributed. This is the provision of God, who promised at the beginning this answer for our fall into sin, who has now delivered it, and in this season have those reminiscences of his arrival in the world, his ministry in the world, of his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, his suffering, misery, and death. We don't get the joy of the delivery of new life without knowing what the outcome is going to be. We get to experience it in that sense the way the Virgin Mary does. She has already been told what is going to happen. And I won't go on a long tangent again about how much I dislike that song, Mary, did you know? Mary certainly did know. What she lives with is the, the knowledge, the full comprehension, as fully as any mortal human can, that she carries God in her womb, that he will be rejected and despised by his people and he will be killed. 
Even knowing of his resurrection does not negate the fact that she as the mother must watch her son die, albeit from a distance, to see him rejected and despised by his people. Mary surely knew, but her knowing, along with us, to revisit that tale again and again, every advent. This is the child in this incredible miracle of birth at this beautiful moment with the stars overhead and the animals gathered, wise men who didn't arrive yet, even though we put them in the nativity, but tying together all of these incredible tales of the miracle of the birth of God into the world for our salvation. We cannot escape with the joy of that without always knowing in the back of our minds what it leads to. And so Advent begins with that. It is the child that we rejoice at his coming. He is the king and we rejoice at his coming. We rejoice at his entry to his kingdom in Jerusalem. We rejoice at his suffering and death, knowing that his suffering and death is that which cancels out the guilt of our sin, that which puts us back in the favor and grace of God the Father, that which cancels out our iniquity, even as was promised to Adam and Eve. This is the incredible joy of the child who is born to die, the child who is born to suffer, the child who is born to be rejected, the child who is the provision of God for our sins. Yes, all of the things we do to try to control our life and control the outcomes and to be prepared for anything, much of which is perfectly responsible to do, don't get me wrong, but we know that we're only doing the best we can against what might manifest. The provision of God is contrarily perfect. He has promised it from the beginning. He has known since the beginning of the creation. He has known what he will do incarnate in the womb of the Blessed Virgin, becoming incarnate in flesh like ours in every way but sin. He has made provision for our failure. He has made provision for our weakness. He has made provision for the death we brought upon ourselves. Even delivering himself here again and again in the waters, the blood of the Passover lamb in baptismal regeneration and being laid in a manger, for us wicked and foul and unclean beasts to feast on and be made fresh and new and whole and restored to both the image and the likeness of God by the body and blood of Christ to be transfigured by that which is put inside us, making us new, transfiguring us even into something that again is in his image and likeness. The provision of God, the Holy Eucharist, in Jesus' name. Amen.